Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Katie Warren, one of the pastors here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here, each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. Hello, friends. Welcome to this worship podcast from St. Paul Lutheran Church. I hope uh, the music, prayers, reflection of this podcast will provide some spiritual renewal for you today as you listen. In just a moment, I'm going to read for you a selection of verses from the Old Testament book of Lamentations. I'm going to take a wild guess that in all likelihood, 
if you have heard or read any of verses from this book, uh, it might just be these few, if that at all. It's sort of strange, really, that there's this whole book of the Bible that's devoted actually to lament, to expressing anger and frustration and sadness with God. And yet the only part that we tend to focus on that is read in any regular way, that's quoted, is these couple of verses right in the middle of the book that sound much more upbeat or happy. You wouldn't even know that there's lament happening in the rest of the book. So today, I want to explore with you a little bit about why these verses appear in the first place. Why, in a book of lament, do we have such beautiful words of hope? What makes the author change their tone so quickly? And how is it possible to be totally distraught, sad, and also hopeful almost simultaneously? Well, the answer might have something to do with our memories, with how and what we choose to remember at any given time. More on that in just a moment. So first, let's take a listen to this uh, few verses from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3 beginning with verse 17. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, gone is my glory and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in the Lord. The Lord is good to those who wait and to the soul who seeks the Lord. Okay, now that we've heard this brief sample of the book, both the lament and the hope, Let's move on to the reflection of these words and what it means to remember God's goodness in our lives, even when it might not be immediately visible or tangible to us. Take a listen. I want to start this morning by asking for your participation, just briefly. I want to pause for just a moment and ask you to think of a memory, any memory at all, from last week or 30 years ago, a memory of a person that you love or a place that maybe you've recently visited, an experience you'll never forget, whatever it might be, just the first thing that comes to mind. I want to give you a moment to pull up that memory for just a second. Hold it in your mind. Think about the sounds or the smells, the surroundings that accompany it. Maybe take note of what feelings come to you as you remember it as well. Imagine it's not hard for you to come up with some memory that brings about all sorts of different feelings and experiences and thoughts. We could spend hours doing this, I'm sure. Tucked away in the crevices of our brains are thousands, probably millions, of memories. These brief little snippets or snapshots that are kind of frozen in time some that are much more vivid, where we can recall all sorts of little details, some that make us smile and others that just make our hearts ache, and everything in between, I imagine, too. But I'm more and more convinced that it's our memories from the past that do so much actually to inform how we approach the future, or for that matter, even right here in the present. Let me give you an example. I have a one-year-old at home who has recently decided to boycott sleeping every couple of nights. And so every few nights she wakes up in the middle of the night and wants to just sort of hang out, keep her eyes open. She's not interested in sleeping. So sometimes when I'm sitting there in the rocker at 2 a.m., deliriously tired, holding this little girl who I love immensely but absolutely do not want to see at this moment in time, I think about, I picture in my head a day in the past when I slept through the night. (laughs) It feels like years ago. It was years ago, actually. But it did happen. And that memory, it gives me hope (laughs) that there will be someday in the future I might actually sleep again at 
sounds wonderful. And it doesn't just apply necessarily to happy memories, of course. A few weeks ago, I was talking with my cousin, who ha has been in recovery for a few years, regularly attends AA meetings, and he talked about how sometimes when he has that urge to drink, he thinks about the past. He brings up memories of the poor decisions he's made, or who he was that he does not want to be again. Those memories motivate him to commit to sobriety today. They continue to shape who he will be into the future. It's what we remember from the past that helps our outlook, our hope for today. And it's about the only explanation I can come up with with these words that we hear in this strange Old Testament book we call Lamentations that Sarah read a few moments ago. The name alone uh, doesn't exactly lend itself to a, being a book that people are just itching to uh, open up and start reading. Spoiler alert, the content matches the title. Uh, here's how the book begins. It says, How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her own distress. It sounds like kind of a downer, right? It's not exactly an uplifting book for the most part. Lamentations is a book of poetry written to lament, to name out loud the distress, the heartache, even the anger that people have, uh, what they've endured and what they feel towards God now in this moment. The city that it's referencing is Jerusalem after it's been totally destroyed, just leveled. That's how the book starts. And from there, the author sort of cries out to God, wondering why they have had to bear so much, facing famine and violence. The people who didn't die at the hands of the Babylonians, the people who came into the city of Jerusalem, most of the people who survived were then, or who didn't die were carried off into slavery. The tears, the rage of that experience is what produced this book of lamentations. It probably rivals Job as the most depressing book uh, in the whole Bible. But then, what feels like almost out of nowhere, right in the middle of this little book, are probably the only verses you may have ever heard of or read from Lamentations. They're the inspiration for the great hymn of the church, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And they sound unlike any other part of the book. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness beautiful words of personal faith, of God's faithfulness to us, especially when you consider the background that just a couple verses before you hear words like, my soul is absent of any peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. And the more I've read it, the more I wondered to myself, where in the world did those words of such hope come from right in the middle of all this sadness and grief? How does the author go from absolute despair and hopelessness to assurance and praising God almost within the same breath? We don't really know, of course. You could argue, maybe it was just kind of cathartic, the, the author is just getting it all out, allowing the tears to flow, to yell at God until you kind of have nothing left to do, but move forward change your disposition a bit. That's one explanation. But it sounds to me like there's a little something more happening here. Like there was almost this intentional decision made to speak with hope, to name this faith in God that no matter how abandoned they may have felt, they will still speak a word of praise. And I wonder if it might just be what allows this author to go from saying, my soul is bowed down to therefore I will have hope. What shifts that perspective is their memory. Their memory. 
somewhere in the far recesses of their mind, they can pull up a memory of the old days, the days before the suffering and the heartache, the days when life was better and God's blessings were so much clearer. They were able to pull up memories of joy-filled days when neither food nor peace were hard to come by, maybe even subconsciously felt or thought to themselves, if God has been good in the past, which I know I can remember, then surely a loving and kind God will be loving and kind again. Even if it feels as though so much has changed, God is here. God will be here. It's what one theologian calls an act of remembering forward. Our memory is informed by our own personal experience of days with less burdens or with more joy. Even when it might not feel possible, we have scripture that serves as its sort of own source of memories from thousands of years ago, this story of God's love and grace that persists and shows up over and over and over again. We get to lean on that knowledge, those stories, that help us remember there's much to remember in the past that informs our present condition, our current struggles, and it doesn't mean that God has disappeared. Sometimes remembering is all we have left of our faith. We know it was, so we walk in faith that it can, it will, in fact, be different, will be that way again. In a similar sort of way, this happens all the time when we, when we grieve the loss of someone that we love. We hold on to things that that person owned or pictures of them. It's a way of remembering not just who they were, but also who they continue to be for us. In my office, there's this letter opener that belonged to my mom. It has her name inscribed on the handle. I think it was a gift of hers when she retired. There's nothing special about this letter opener. It wasn't something my mom treasured or loved deeply. But for some reason, I grabbed it off her desk and brought it home with me after she died, and I put it on my desk so that when I look at it, I can picture it sitting on her desk. When I hold it in my hand, I can almost imagine my mom's hand holding it as well. And maybe more to the point, when I it catches my eye from time to time. It makes me sometimes stop to think about who my mom was. And I have hope that her love, her kindness, her generosity, they live on today through me, through all sorts of people in different ways. In a way, I am remembering through this silly little letter opener (laughs) that even in grief there is hope. There is joy to be found. Part of who she was is still here today, continues on. We do that same thing actually every single Sunday. We reenact this ritual in this space of worship where we gather around a table and we participate in a meal that millions of people have done over thousands of years. It's this ritual, a sacrament, that draws on memory. God's past faithfulness feeds into our assurance of what God will do in the future. God's mercy and grace and forgiveness, they were poured and promised to our ancestors. And so we remember that it's offered to us too. It was Orson Welles who once said, if you want to have a happy ending, it depends of course on where you end the story. Which is to say, if things in this world, in our own lives, don't seem to be the way they should or the way we would wish them to be. Our task is to keep looking forward while also still remembering. Whether it's on this side of heaven or not, if we learn anything from this peculiar little book called Lamentations, it's that today is not the end of that story. We have been promised that God's mercies are new every morning. And today is no exception. Neither is tomorrow, for that matter. God's faithfulness has endured for generations. 
so we remember forward. And in doing so, we live with hope. Amen. We'll turn now to God in prayer, speaking the words Jesus taught us through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Whatever the coming days hold for you, whatever challenges or joys might be coming your way, may you be blessed with a faithful memory, remembering forward the faithfulness of God. May the knowledge of who God is and who God has been, may it be a blessing and a source of hope for you today and always. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Thank you for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to endeavors that 
lend hope to other people, stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way, you feel a great part of that reach. So tune in next Thursday for another edition of St. Paul Podcast.